right, thank you for joining us for today's Aquarium at Home live stream. We are here in our Delta Country Gallery, and this is the Gopher Tortoise exhibit. Thank you very much for that, Jennifer. Hello. Jennifer is our on-screen expert today, and she is one of our animal care specialists. Are you a specialist too? I am a senior animal care specialist. Senior animal care specialist. Yes. Guys, we've got a treat today. She's our senior, senior. animal care specialist. Senior, I'm old. And today, uh, <laughs> given where we are, it makes sense that we'll be talking about gopher tortoises. So yep. uh, we're going to get one of our gopher tortoises out of this exhibit, and we're going to take him over to a nearby table to give you a better look, a closer look at him and some of the unique adaptations that make them ideally suited to the habitat in which they live. So we can try this for a second, but uh, we have some other residents here in our gopher park. So this is one of them. This is our gulf hammock rat snake who has been very excited lately with the temperatures warming up to stick his head out of our burrow. So it may be a little bit of a catch a snake while we're talking about our gopher tortoises. So gopher tortoises are really unique in that they provide homes to, oh gosh, hundreds of different animals. So little tiny things like spiders, insects, small mammals, rodents, different types of uh, little mammals may go in and of course they're going to provide homes for themselves. So they build these really really cool burrow systems like this one here. We've actually built this one for them. So uh, you, they would come down in here and they would dig for 10, 20, 30 feet and the gopher tortoise burrow is going to be the length of that burrow and the width of it and they might be calling that place home and again other friends might be joining them so what they'll do down in those burrows is they'll make kind of a little intricate network they may be laying their eggs down there and they're gonna be found in the longleaf pine forest and those habitats get really hot in the summer so they may be escaping that extreme heat while they're down there they may be escaping cooler weather again laying some eggs there are a lot of species that are known to use this part of our burrow which is the apron um, so they'll use kind of just this outward part and right here as kind of a safety zone but as you can see our snakes are waking up a little bit so our gopher tortoises do live in here with three snakes all the time again this is our gulf hammock rat snake who's very excited to see casey and we also have a yellow rat snake and a corn snake. So this is our yellow rat snake here, and this is our corn snake. And we do have another gopher tortoise. There's two of them in here. He's kind of actually tucked underneath all of our snakes over there right now. So they have different little burrows they can get away from uh, and kind of escape that extreme heat and those <laughs> cold temperatures. And yes, yeah, see, this is what I said. This is why we can't leave the door open with you lately, because you just want to run, run, run. It actually has been very interesting as the weather warms to kind of watch this exhibit come to life. I mean, during the, yes. during the winter, you know, the snakes are, for the most part, seem like they're all kind of balled up in a little snaky ball. Yeah, uh, they down normally the all the are right here. Uh, but in the last couple of weeks, it seems like they've really come, come alive and are out and getting more active, which has really been kind of cool to watch. Yeah. Uh, looks like we got a lot of people watching. Speaking of watching. Uh, thank you all for joining us for today's Aquarium at Home live stream. And uh, we have a couple of questions that have already come in. Well, comments. Uh, Randy makes this coolest job ever. So lucky. You are correct, Randy. This is an awesome, awesome job. Whether you're talking about me or talking about Jennifer, uh, we all have very cool jobs here at the aquarium. And uh, thank you for saying that. Yeah, thank you. Laura McNutt says, what kind of turtle is that? We're going to get to that, but that is uh, a gopher tortoise. Yeah. This the subject of today's stream. The gopher tortoise, and there are turtles and tortoises, and tortoises are going to generally live their life on the land. So just like you see here, there's not a whole lot of water present, whereas if you look over there, that's a whole lot of water and a whole lot of turtles. So turtles are going to be living their life mostly in that water, tortoises on the land. However, you may see the tortoises go down to the water. Maybe they want to take a little dip, a little swim. Uh, they'll also maybe drink some of the water. So we do have a water bowl in here all the time for our snakes and our turtles and our tortoise rather, as I just explained that. Um, but these guys will also get some daily misting, just like our grass when we wake up in the morning is a little dewy, a little wet. Uh, we wanna make sure that the humidity in here is good for these guys. So we'll kind of mist everything in the morning. It's a lot of fun to do. Our corn snake, especially this gentleman here, really likes to drink from the mister and not from the water bowl. Uh, so he is a lot of fun to get to work with. 
All right, well, uh, Jennifer, you mentioned earlier that we're gonna actually take one of our GoPro tortoises out so that those of yes. you who are watching on the live stream can get a little bit of a closer view because these guys have some really interesting physical adaptations, so physical characteristics that make them ideally suited to the habitat where they're, or to the kinds of habitat that they create for themselves and the ecosystem where they're found. And that is a bit of a clue to today's Weekday Wonders question of the day, which is what is the difference between a habitat and an ecosystem? And if you're not familiar with Weekday Wonders, that's a new series of curated hands-on activities that we have created, or our education department has created, to help kind of give some Incentive for those of you who are home with kids, many of you probably watching are in that situation. Get them out of the house, get them away from screens, get them out in the backyard doing some active things, having some thought-provoking conversations with you and maybe with each other to have some, uh, some good science time out in the yard. So uh, again, we're having daily questions associated with that, that series and today's question is, as I said, what is the difference between a habitat and an ecosystem? So Jennifer, if you can multitask, Maybe you can both get snakes back in the exhibit, answer that question, and recover our turtle. How do yeah. you feel about trying to do that? I would love to. So mostly I put some food in front of him to see if he was going to wake up, but it looks like we're pretty sleepy. Uh, kind of right now is nap time for reptiles generally, so we'll see if we can get him up, wrangle those snakes, and our habitat is going to be anything that's providing food, water, shelter, safety, those survival things that we all need. And then ecosystems are going to be all of those habitats from a variety of area into one. Um, so lots, lots going on in our habitat today. We're gonna see if we can get this little guy out real quick. Hello, good afternoon, sir. And we're going to also turn around. We're gonna close the door so that our escapees don't escape. There we go, right out the door. Little snake wrangling as we go. Yeah, we all wear we all wear many hats here at the aquarium, and today Jennifer's job is both gopher wrangler and snake catcher. All right, so let's bring this little guy over here. Now we're definitely awake. Um, a little groggy though, so we're gonna give him a little bit of time. Just gotta hang out and chill, and maybe we can talk about him just a little bit more. So one of the other names for a gopher tortoise is an elephant tortoise. So if you look at their feet here, you're gonna see that he is very well equipped for digging. Now, especially these hind legs here, they kind of look like an elephant's foot, if you've ever seen one of those guys at the zoo. So very, very similar foot here. And again, quite a bit of nail going on because he'll use mostly these digging uh, tools up here, but he'll use those back legs as well as he's wandering through a burrow. So it looks like we're a little bit away. We'll see if he would like to have some food. Out in the wild, these guys are gonna basically just be grazers. They're gonna be opportunistic. They like to eat a little bit of everything. And so, different leaves and grasses, but also some fruits and some berries, maybe even some flowers. So our guys here, probably their absolute favorite thing is actually a diet that we have pre-made. So it's a little red cube. And they seem to really enjoy it. Turtles and tortoises generally see red a little bit better. And so they like this food a lot. However, this platform is new, so we're exploring the platform, which is totally okay. Well, while we explore, uh, we do have some comments and questions that have come in. So let me try and catch up a little bit on some of those. Uh, let's see, we've got a lot of shout outs coming in. People are saying they're watching from uh, Boaz, Alabama. Hello, Corey, thank you for joining us. Uh, Dylan, Deacon, and Devin are so excited for this. They love those snakes, says Amelia Gennings or Jennings, as I usually do. I'll go ahead and apologize for mispronouncing last names. That's bound to happen. Uh, Angela Hunter is watching from Glasgow, Kentucky. So we've got multiple states uh, associated with this stream so far, which is great. Ah, and a good question. So Josie Hunter would like to know, on behalf of Mallon and Lincoln, how do they not fight? And I guess she's talking about, I'm not sure if she's talking about the tortoises or the turtles, but maybe the tortoises and the turtles. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about what keeps everybody copacetic and happy with each other? Yeah, so you know, generally for these guys, there's a little bit of mutual respect going on because these tortoises are building those really awesome burrows and keeping all these different animals safe. So they're gonna hang out, they're gonna live together and they're gonna thrive. But you know, everybody also gets fed on a regular basis. And our snakes are not gonna be looking at our gopher tortoises as food. They're way, way, way too big. Now that's not to say that a snake may not want a smaller turtle uh, as a prey item, but for these guys, a little bit of respect going on there, creating those burrow systems. Now our tortoises, uh, they're, I believe they're coming up on 15 years old. And so they're starting to mature and you're starting to see 
both of them, uh, we're thinking they're both males, so they're starting to do kind of their little head dances and bobbing around and trying to show each other who's boss. But we don't have any problems with that, and we continue to monitor and watch them as they continue to mature, which has been a lot of fun to watch too. They are getting a lot bigger. When I started working with these guys, I would say they were probably only, only about that big. So as you can see today, you know, that's maybe like the back half. So lots and lots of growth, which has been fun. So how old were they when, they, when you started to work with them? Oh gosh, that was nine years ago, so five maybe. Wow, okay, yeah. so uh, we got more questions coming in uh, while we decide whether or not we're gonna eat. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Ashley, Armstrong, Ashley Armstrong wants to know, what do you use the clicker for on your wrist? I'm not sure what she's talking about. Yes, uh, she was very, very insightful there. So yep, there is a clicker on my wrist. These guys are actually training. Uh, they're learning how to touch their nose. To this target. However, if we cannot get beyond waking up, it's very hard to offer the target stick. They just tend to ignore it, do their own thing, maybe go back to sleep in the burrow. Um, so I brought it out just in case we got really excited because I would love to show you guys that training. However, we don't even really like the food in front of us right now. We're still very sleepy. Uh, Josie Davis asks, what kind of snake is it? Uh, so there were multiple snakes mm -hmm. in that exhibit and we're not looking at the exhibit at the moment, but Jennifer, if you could just go by color, uh, and say what each of those colored snakes are. If you want to go back in the stream, maybe you can get yep. that question answered. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the biggest and the oldest in there is our yellow rat snake. So he's the only yellow snake that's in there. And then we have our gulf hammock rat snake, which is the gray individual, and our corn snake, uh, who is kind of reddish orange. Okay. So uh, Sarah Meyer says hello from Nashville. Hello to you, Hi. Sarah. Uh, what's the difference between, between a gopher tortoise and a sulcata? So it's going to be range where they live and also their size. So these guys are not going to be getting nearly as large as the sulcata tortoises. And again, these guys, their feet are even more equipped for that digging. They kind of have little shovels down here on these feet. So not that tortoises don't dig most tortoises well, but these guys are just highly equipped using these front little shovels, as I like to call them. Okay. All right, going through a few of these more. Uh, so Kyle's uncle Joel and Aunt Rose are saying <laughs> hello from uh, South Dakota. This is uh, Joel Phillips. Yes, hello guys. All right, so it uh, looks like we made our, our way through all the questions and comments that have come in so far, but keep oh. them coming. We're happy to pass them on. I know that Jennifer is a fount of knowledge, so she will, I'm sure, be happy to answer them. But in the meantime, uh, can you talk a little bit about where these guys will be found? So what's their, what's their range? So it's going to be the southeast, mostly uh, large populations in South Georgia and Florida throughout. Those are, again, those large pine leaf forests that we find down there. Uh, the bad part, though, is, like I was talking about earlier, they're building these burrows to escape those extreme temperatures. So Florida tends to catch fire every summer now. Um, so that is destroying a little bit of their habitat, but living underground, super helpful. Um, and these guys, they're going into habitats that are completely wiped out and destroyed, devoid of life. And then they start seeing these gopher tortoises emerge the next season. And it's really cool because they're still surviving these crazy, crazy temperatures that we've got going on. And uh, as we've talked about, their burrows are incredibly important, not only to themselves, but to the many animals that rely on them for shelter. And so that makes them pretty special. Uh, and they have a special name for that kind of, for someone whose work maybe benefits other animals. So can you talk a little bit about keystone species? What is a keystone species and, and what role do they play in the ecosystem where they're found? Yeah, so for these guys, they're a keystone species because again, they're making those burrows. So they're providing one of those things that we all need to have, the food, water, safety, shelter. They're providing that safety, that shelter. So they're allowing lots and lots of different animals to survive in these burrow systems with them that maybe would not have been able to survive. And not just that one individual, but if there is a pregnant female animal of any type who's coming into that burrow and laying those eggs, whether it's a snake or small mammal, those eggs are hatching the next generation is being allowed to live as well. So they're really important. Again, I mentioned in the beginning, it's like three, 400 different animals, depending on where they are, are gonna go into that burrow at some point uh, within that year, which is pretty remarkable. It's a really huge variety of animals too. I know that there are even some kinds of birds that, that rely on these, yep. these burrows. Yep, birds, you know, frogs, we think about other amphibians, snakes, like we've got our reptiles in there, uh, some small mice, I think some owls have even, small burrowing owls have been known to go down there. So just a huge variety. And again, the apron, the beginning of the burrow is also super important for some small to even medium sized mammals. Uh, that's again safety because these guys are constantly going in and out kind of monitoring that burrow. 
and it's providing safety around the entrance as well. All right, so we've got uh, an additional hello from Perez or Perez, Jimmy. Sorry about that. Uh, mm -hmm. Hi from Aaron, Tennessee. Hello to you too. Hello. So and, we're just gonna walk over. Uh, so Amelia Jennings asks on behalf of uh, Deacon H5 how they are able to go all the way into their shell. So these guys can pull all the way in, uh, but the front legs kind of more or less just talk. Really, they don't go all the way in. So there are some turtles that their neck will actually go around the outside of the shell. These guys, their feet kind of do stick out a little, but the back can go in. Um, I don't really, I don't, he's very comfortable. As you can see, we've done a lot of training. He likes back scratches, he likes neck scratches. It's hard to get him to go in that shell. Uh, but you can see there as he's folding it up, it just kind of folds up and they can pull it back in his whole head. And the majority of those legs will be in there. So that was an excellent question. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Uh, Joel Whipple says, Josiah would like to know how much that they weigh when they're full grown. So how big can uh, they get? You know, on average, probably 30 pounds, but there's always extremes and minimums. So, you know, probably anywhere from about 20 to 50 pounds. These guys right now are only, um, I want to say about six pounds. They're not very heavy. In this All right. Uh, Angela Hunter says, how long do they live in the wild and in captivity? So in the, when they're in human care, yeah. how long will they, yeah. will they, can they live for? Yeah, so these guys will live like a lot of other tortoises, probably at least 50 years, but most likely a lot more than that. And then in human care, gosh, you know, easily probably up to 100 years. So a lot of animals do tend to live a little bit longer in professional care, which is awesome. It's however leading us to this new trend of how do we take care of our animals, just like how do we take care of ourselves as we age, because some of these animals, we've not seen how they age because in the wild, they don't live that long. So it's been a lot of fun to get to know all these animals and get to take care of them throughout their entire life. Yeah, and there are good reasons for, for why animals tend to live a lot longer in human care. I mean, they're, th these are sort of ideal circumstances in terms yes. of, and, and for a lot of different reasons. I mean, nutrition, they're getting medical care. Mm -hmm. They have paranoid keepers looking at them every single day, making sure, you know, everything is okay. And then you have to, you almost have to take a step back sometimes and say, hey, everything, you know, it works out in nature. So sometimes, you know, taking that back step is good too, but we do try to have a lot of preventative maintenance and care of all of our animals throughout the aquarium. Uh, David Miller wants to know, do they live in a community and are they social? <sighs> so there's definitely a chance that you'll find more than one tortoise in a burrow, but I don't necessarily think that I would call it social or pairing or anything like that. Um, but they will live uh, just among a lot of different animals. They do, however, seem to be very social now that we're awake with you, Casey, and that camera. He knows where it is. Um, but yeah, these guys, they'll definitely, again, be respectful and hang out with a lot of different animals in their burrow and, and not really worry too much about who's in their house. Yeah, you know, we like to call these guys kind of the, the condominium builders of the natural yes. world. So they're responsible for providing a lot of housing for other people, but it's kind of like you don't really hang out with your landlord. Yeah, exactly. And that's what, that's what these guys are, the little landlords of our borough. Yeah. Uh, so no one has asked, but what do they, what, what, do, what do we feed them? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier that kind of wild diet of, you know, grazers, basically. So here at the aquarium, they get a lot of romaine, and if you look at it, it's got some white powder on it. That's calcium powder. That's something we add. And so that's then, not Parmesan, then? No, it's not Parmesan. I wish. That would be a good salad. And then this is their little diet that I was talking about. That was one of their favorite things. So this is actually a product that is made for monkeys. Um, but it's a vegetarian pellet, so we've been able to use it. It's been very successful at a lot of zoos and aquariums for turtles and tortoises alike. We also have another grassland diet, so similar to that, but it's made of all grasses. And these guys get super spoiled and get a dried flower mix about once a week. And then last week they had some blackberries. So as we get different fruits, sometimes uh, we'll put a little bit of fruit in that diet as well. All right, and you mentioned that clicker earlier and that uh, blue wand that we see on that, yes. that barrel over there. So what are the kinds of things that you would want to train a gopher tortoise yeah. to do? So, I mean, that's, it, this isn't about doing tricks. It's never about doing yeah. tricks. It's about, there's always a reason for why yeah. we would train so an animal. so we're trying to give all of our animals, you know, more choice, more control in their habitat and their environment. And so when you saw me earlier, I had to pick him up and bring him over here, which is okay. Again, he's very desensitized to us working with him, but we want it to be up to them. They didn't want to come out. 
they totally don't have to. So what we're trying to do is with that target stick, just have them touch their nose to it. And every time they touch it, they get that piece of food. And that way we can move them around the habitat if we need to, say if we were cleaning, or we could get them all the way out, maybe say onto like a ramp, and then bring them over here. And they will also step up and down off of the scale so we can keep good weights on. And you uh, are actually involved in training some other animals as well that you probably wouldn't think of as uh, needing training. So can you yeah. talk a little bit about your other responsibilities as a senior animal care specialist? Yeah, so basically reptiles is the name of the game here for me. I do work with our otters as well, but our reptiles is something, like Casey was just saying, we don't often think about. And one of those groups are our American alligators that's behind Casey over there, out basking on are really smart. Basically anything you could teach a cat or a dog, you could teach to an alligator. They're food motivated, they're young alligators, they're willing to learn, they have a lot of fun learning. We actually did a training session with them today. Um, so they are learning lots of things. They know their names. So when you come to the aquarium, when we open our doors, we can get all you guys back in here, which would be super exciting. You can see that they have different color nail caps. That's how we tell them apart, but it's also the name. So every alligator has a color, so blue, purple, pink. And we can call them up onto our beach. We can ask them to get up and down the scale. We can ask them to walk through our kennel so that if we need to transport them for any reason, they also have a couple of sounds that bring them to the front and the back of the habitat. So just anything we can do to help take care of them a little bit better, kind of have them partner in their own healthcare with us and make it just less stressful is always super nice. And for those of you who are watching, first of all, again, thank you very much. And rest assured that we will probably be revisiting our alligators with a future live at some point. So more information about those guys to come. We do have one more question, which is uh, our gopher tortoise is a lot like cherry head redfoot tortoises. This is a question from Sarah Lynn. Again, every tortoise is going to be a little bit different. So everybody's got their own unique size, their own unique habitat. But tortoises as a whole are those turtles that are living their life on the land, relying on the land not so much the water actually the majority of the water that they need to survive they consume through those foods again through grazing different fruits and berries and flowers all right well so we look like we're coming to an end of our questions here and i hope that uh, those of you who are watching are not holding those questions back if you do have any more questions please type them down in the comments and i'll pass them on uh, but while we've got a little bit of a break here i'll just go ahead and point out that you know, these streams are our way of making sure that you're connecting with our animals, giving you a little bit of a chance to de-stress, to, to connect, like I said, with the natural world and, <laughs> and, you know, have a break from the situation that a lot of us find ourselves in where we're kind of trapped in the house. Uh, we do have a lot of other resources available, actually. If you go to our website, tnaqua.org, and then go to our Aquarium at Home section, we have a lot of different resources like activity pages that you can print off, coloring pages. Uh, we've got that Weekday Wonders series of educational activities that I mentioned earlier. See if he's going to eat, maybe. Aha. I didn't think he could not eat his favorite food. Sorry so, I cut you off. No, it's okay. So do, do make sure that if you're at home with uh, kids or if you need a little bit of a break yourself, uh, we do have all those resources there just for you to kind of give you a toolkit to keep your kids distracted or again, keep yourself distracted during this, uh, this kind of trying time that we find ourselves in. And as we've mentioned on every live stream thus far, we do have people like Jennifer still working today. The animals are still getting the care they always get, so that nothing has changed on that front, but you know that does come with a bit of expense. So if you'd like to contribute to the aquarium's emergency donate or emergency relief fund, uh, we do have one set up that you can contribute to and help us kind of weather this financial storm that we're enduring while we can't have guests like those of you who are watching come through the building and see these animals in person you know those the care requirements do continue so if you feel like donating to that fund you can go to tnaqua.org click on the donate button and that'll get you through to a form where you can fill out and make a contribution which we would very much appreciate it's by no means necessary but uh, any every little bit counts in the current circumstances and these guys love to eat so we'll be constantly buying food for everybody here at the aquarium for sure All right, look, let me see what other questions have come up while we've been doing that. Oh, so Karen Estes would like to know, do they get water through their food or do they drink water? A little bit of both. So they'll get a lot of the water naturally out in, you know, Florida. 
from their food, but they're gonna go and try to find a you know a little stream or a river maybe and just go down and stick their heads in. Uh, I don't see it all that often. Uh, we mentioned earlier in our exhibit that they had a water bowl. I have walked by kind of mid to late afternoon and they will just have their head in it and you'll see them drinking water. Our snakes will do it as well. But oftentimes it is just gonna be in their food that they're getting. So Amelia Jennings is asking again, another question on the part of eight-year-old Dylan. How you become? How do you become a reptile trainer? That's such a cool job. So you know, just a little bit of school, and then get your foot in the door. So a lot of people start out as volunteers or interns, and then you just kind of find what you're passionate about and what animal group that is, and then just have some fun with it. A lot of people didn't realize that you could do training with really any reptile. It's kind of new within the last 10 years. And we're finding that these guys are really smart. They've got lots of personalities. You get to know them as individuals a lot more. Um, we have a couple of soft shell turtles over there that we do some training with. And we do training with our snapping turtles, which is really fun. It's fun to see a 165 pound turtle. You make a little sound in the water, he comes running. So it's a lot of fun to do this training with him. All right, so Danielle Pope White uh, says, she's not really much of a, Hi, this, is, this isn't a comment, this is really more of a, of a cautionary statement that turtles and tortoises do not make great pets as they will outgrow and outlive you. That is actually very true. Very true, very, very true. Yeah, a lot of these species are going to, again, live 50 years or more. Uh, oftentimes for tortoises, it's about 100 years. There's a lot of turtle species, again, that, you know, the median lifespan, 30 to 60, but they're living into their 80s. So this is definitely, if, you know, a lifetime commitment and it's great here at the aquarium because even when i'm not here anymore there's going to be another keeper but at your house it's definitely not a good pet and they're really stinky uh they're really really stinky uh lou everman says i remember you all said you get the penguins from sea world uh or we got our penguins from sea world not all of our penguins came from sea world um some of them were born here on exhibit but is there a special place where the tortoises come from too no not really so all of our turtles tortoises we kind of go to different zoos and aquariums and they will say, hey, we have these animals available. Would you like them? Um, so each one of our animals generally has a different story as to where they came from. And you can look back in records and find that out uh, for each individual if you're interested. Now, do the gopher tortoises have a have a favorite food? Is are these pellets their favorite food? That red pellet is probably their absolute favorite food. Even when we're sleepy, that is one of the things that they don't tend to stick their nose up in the air at. So you saw it took him a little while to wake up, but once now he's awake, he's been very excited about that pellet. And they're the reason it's so soft is because they've been soaked in water, so they get a little extra water into that as well. Uh, so David Miller asks, has the Tennessee Aquarium ever had baby gopher tortoises born there? We have not. So both of these guys, again, are quite young. And so we're just starting to see that maturity happen and we think we have two males. So I don't, I don't think we're going to be going down that path, sadly. They would be very, very cute. Now, some of you may wonder, so they're, you said 15 years old. Uh, 15 years old might seem like an exceptionally long time. By the time you have a dog that's 15 years old, obviously Absolutely. that dog is, is a pretty old dog. Mm -hmm. And by that point, they could have had many many litters of pups so that's a good segue to talking about the fact that turtles tend to be not only long-lived but pretty late to mature so that's that's why it can be kind of a problem when you have turtles that go missing from a particular population if a particular population is impacted by human activity or some other change to their environment the ramifications of that loss of even a couple of individuals can be pretty huge yeah it can definitely change a population very very quickly because again some of these turtles, they lay eggs once a year, maybe twice, and then some of them only lay eggs every couple of years. So any any individual is super important, and anyone who goes missing is going to disrupt their population for sure. All right, well, it looks like we're approaching the end of this live stream. The questions have kind of petered off, which is fine. I hope that those of you who are not watching or outside in your backyards using those weekday wonders activities, getting some, getting to stretch your legs a little bit and open your eyes, broaden your horizons, we're happy if you can make use of them. Again, those are at tnaqua.org. In our Aquarium at Home section, there's a link to where you can access all of those different activities in our daily question. And uh, yeah, for those of you who've been watching with us the entire time, thank you very much for joining us. These questions have been excellent. Make sure you take, a time, take the time to share this with your friends who you think might be interested. Because who isn't interested in watching a gopher tortoise have a snack? <laughs> That's pretty, uh, pretty cool stuff. 
So we try and do these live streams once a day, usually around 1 p.m., but do check the Facebook page, the Aquarium's Facebook page every morning at around around 11 o'clock. We usually post some sort of announcement of what today's live stream will be about and uh, who will be who will be focusing on. So visit our live stream uh, or visit our social media to keep track of how, how often we're gonna be going live and who we'll talk about. Use that Aquarium at Home collection of activities to keep your kids and yourself sane during this trying time that we find ourselves in. And thank you very, very much for joining us. We will see you next time.